tonight to Indigo Manny Life for some Malcolm Gladwell. So I just want to make sure that everyone here, everyone's going to be an expert on these instructions, but if you are not seated, you are currently standing and A could hear me. Can everyone hear me up there? Awesome. So if you are there, if you are here, if you are anywhere and you would like your book signed by Malcolm Gladwell, you are going to need to have a group slip. So just make sure you have a group slip. Come and see me to get one. And if not, then you could push and shove to get the best spot possible as long as anyone in the suit doesn't tell you not to. Thank you so much. My colleague Randy, who just had the microphone, I think she went over the grouping system. So let's just go over quickly the actual signing. For those folks that are seated, don't worry, stay seated. Once the event is over, we'll put a signing table up onto the stage and we'll just sign row by row by row. There's no limit on the amount of books, which means that holiday's fast approaching in a couple of months. The more books, the better you look like a hero. As long as you have a copy of the new one, you can get as many of the new one and then the backlist. So if you have your backlist as well, just make sure you have uh, David and Goliath. There's uh, candid photos only. It's not posed photos because there's a lot of people that we need to get through. Other than that, uh, the format's pretty simple. It's a Q&A with our chief book lover, Heather Reisman, followed by a few questions from the audience. Then we go right into a book signing. And don't forget to join us on Tuesday when commander of Expedition 35, Chris Hatfield, is here for an event to launch his new book. And if you want to see this, Video online or other videos, Indigo Inspired, or the top of our event page, there's a blog on every single page of our homepage and other pages as well within our site. So click it on, you'll see event footage. Green Room is our handle on Twitter. We'll be live tweeting throughout the night. Be sure to follow us, and you can also see the pictures we've uploaded. Wow, this is fantastic. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a fabulous Thursday night. Um, for everybody who's standing, because we always worry about making you as comfortable as we can, at the very least, feel free to take off your coats, and if anybody wants to sit on the floor, um, it's okay with me, as long as no fire marshal starts it so that you can get as comfortable. I'm Heather Reeson, Indigo's chief book lover, and it's always a joy to have the opportunity to welcome someone to our stage and do the, the thing that we worry almost disappears in the age of digital, and that is to have a conversation with people face to face where we can engage the audience and a writer and myself in a special night. Um, so tonight we have Malcolm Gladwell, and how great is that? <laughs> and a brilliant new writer. And I'm sure like the rest of you in this room, you can remember exactly where you were when you read The Tipping Point. I certainly can. Four years later um, came the actual Tipping Point book, built from the article, and since then we've had Blink, Outliers, What the Dog Saw, and now David and Goliath. The David and Goliath is particularly interesting to me because I have always felt to be a David in this industry. So, um, really great. Each book has looked at change, uh, decision-making, talent, and success through adversity in ways that make us stop and give our own brains a shake. That's how I always feel that um, Malcolm gives my brain a shake because he is simply amazing, amazing at destroying preconceptions. And that's what David and Goliath is all about. We look at obstacles and adversity as things that are entirely negative, but some of the most successful people are those who take a quote or uh, take the, the notion of weakness, quote unquote weakness, and turn it into a strength. Um, but Malcolm will be able to explain it much better than I can. Please formally welcome Malcolm Gradwell. So I was scribbling these notes tonight and thinking how much I was going to enjoy this uh, opportunity. So we're just delighted that you're here. Um, just um, for people who have not yet read the book and know you, give us just the quick essence of the David Goliath idea and kind of what, what drew you to 
uh, this notion? The, the book is basically about advantages and disadvantages and whether we get them mixed up. Um, uh, I, half of the book looks at what looked like strong, powerful, overwhelming forces and points at all the ways in which they are vulnerable. And the other half looks at situations in which you think someone is facing overwhelming odds and points out the ways in which they are enriched by those experiences. Um, so it's, uh, it's about complicating our understanding of what helps you and what hurts you. That's really what the book is, um, is about. And, and did some series of observations or incidents or experiences stay in your mind and just kind of sit there until all of a sudden you thought this was an idea? How did, how did this particular book happen? Well, a lot of different things. You know, in the last book I did, Outliers, when I so was sitting down and I would talk to all these very successful people, and I was always struck by how when they accounted for their success, they spent as much time talking about what went wrong as what went right. Um, and all the things... So it was most striking. There was a chapter in Outliers about Jewish lawyers in New York and how they rose to the top of their profession. And it was always fascinating to me because their story was all... They all had the same story. They were all children of garment workers who went to mediocre colleges, then mediocre law schools, and then got locked out of all the top law firms. There was nothing in their early success. And then, as it turned out, every one of those facts became advantageous as time went on. Um, and because, I just muscle was, built, because they muscle built from it? or they well, had because, to deal with Yeah, one is that they... They were just way hungrier than mm -hmm. the people, the, the kind of old guard they were up against. The old guard thought that mergers and acquisitions was a distasteful form of law, and so left it to the, up, to the Jewish upstarts, because it was, they didn't want to sully their hands with it. Well then, of course, so these guys practiced M&A law for 25 years, and suddenly it became the most important law of all, right? So it was this kind of gift to have been locked out of the mainstream. Um, but it was that, that sort of idea stuck in my head. And I, I just thought it would be, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, our, that we have such an unsophisticated notion of, um, of what helps us. Um, and that, that's where and the what, book got started. So you, so you sort of pulled it from that. Um, getting off track, the question I was actually intending to ask, ask next, your story of the Jewish lawyers makes me think, um, Israel has to be the ultimate David in the context of its larger environment. Yeah, in fact, Talk to me a little bit about how you see it, how you saw it originally, how yeah. you see it now. Yeah, so I actually, it's funny because I was very interested in the original biblical story of David and Goliath. And originally I told the story the way we commonly understand it. David was this improbable victor <laughs> over Goliath. And then I discovered that there's been an enormous amount of scholarship on that story almost all of it done by Israelis, including Moshe Dayan writes this, the architect of the Six Day War, the most famous general in Israeli history, writes this famous essay on the story of David and Goliath, in which he disputes that interpretation and says, David actually is just a guy with superior technology who outsmarts his opponent. Why do we think of that as an underdog? He's, he may not be as yeah. big as Goliath, but he's nimbler, smarter, and has a better weapon. And I read this essay and I just thought, you know, first of all, only an Israeli would have had that observation because when Moshe Dayan looked at David, he, thought he, he was looking at, his, at Israel, right? And then all of this turns out as well that a lot of the scholarship on that reinterprets Goliath. So in, in the beginning of my book, I point out not only Moshe Dayan's observation about David having superior technology because the sling that David is armed with turns out to be one of the most devastating weapons in the ancient world. And I actually consulted with a ballistics expert at the, in the Israeli Defense Force who has done the math on David's... Like, it's all Israel. Like, right. And then it was Israeli endocrinologists who pointed out that Goliath is probably suffering from what's called acromegaly, which is a tumor on his pituitary gland, which not only accounts for his size, because it means he overproduces human growth hormone, but also 
these tumors often have the side effect of constricting your optical nerves, and they lead you to have severely restricted eyesight. Goliath is clearly half blind. That accounts for all the weirdness in that story. He's led down to the valley floor by an attendant, which is an odd thing. He doesn't understand that. It takes him forever to, to appreciate the fact that David is clearly not coming to, to engage him in a sword fight. David doesn't even have a sword. I mean, how obvious is it? And Goliath is kind of sitting there. And what makes it all make sense is that the fact that Goliath can only see this far in front of his face. Um, so it's so, it was so hilarious to me that the people who properly interpreted the story are people who live that story every day of their lives. That they're surrounded by these much larger and more powerful neighbors who are as, who are not as strong as they appear. And here they are, this tiny little country, who are far stronger than they appear to be. Um, so it was a kind of it, it is in this very sort of beautiful way. It's an allegory for. Uh, for for modern day Israel, right? Uh, you see it somewhere like that, and it's interesting because the world may no longer see Israel as the underdog there. And but that's yes, yeah, but that's perception. sort of what the book is about as well. That I don't like those terms anymore. You know, mm-hmm. when you finish the book, you shouldn't think of underdogs as underdogs anymore. You should think, you should say, look, the all you should say is you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't look at someone who happens to be powerful and assume they're going to win. That's what. That's really what the. And in all of these stories, I want to. I want to actually go into a few of the stories, which are so incredible. Um, as I read through and thought about each of these stories and and circumstances where I see them, is it not just that there's a cycle, that at some point anybody on top, that's big and bold and looks big and bold and strong, mm-hmm. has vulnerabilities. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent, you you feel that 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 is a question of. Is it the moment at which their vulnerability overtakes them? Like, is it is it yeah. is it the strength of the underdog, or is it the uh, it's both. inherent vulnerability, or both? It's both. It's that um, as you grow into size and strength, you acquire certain vulnerabilities, mm-hmm. and when you are small and nimble, you acquire certain unexpected strengths. Um, I think that's what yeah. it's, and I think you know the story. I mean. Microsoft used to be a scrappy underdog. Now it's a big, bloated enterprise that isn't as innovative as it used to be, right? So you know, I could point to a thousand examples and, of this. And what do people who, are, who perceive themselves and have achieved real success, so they consider themselves uh, strong and confident, what's best for people in that circumstance to do to maintain that incredible... Their scrappiness edge. and that their edge. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know if anyone can answer that. In part, I don't know whether it's always possible in the long run. Um, but I think the uh, the important thing I think is just not to forget the traits that got you where you are. Right. If you got to where you are by being um, scrappy and inventive and um, uh, and disagreeable, which is a f- idea I spend a lot of time on in the book, then don't get fat and happy. <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done. But. <laughs> you look like you're doing a good job of not getting fat. I, I hope on the happy part. And I'm not happy. So, uh, not, so, right. even <laughs> so. <laughs> not even remotely so. Okay. Um, that angst is probably a good part of what brings you. So, you know, I, I, I wonder with the extraordinary insights, I mean, the, in, the, the fundamental insight of Blink and those initial reactions and the, the concept of 10,000 hours. I mean, they're, they're just like fundamental truths. The notion of never get fat and happy, never realize the vulnerability or never perceive yourself as without any opportunity. Mm-hmm. Depending, on. Those insights are so, at their core, so powerful. Um, we look at America today, and you're Canadian, actually, but we're living in America. America really seems to be at a challenging moment. Let's put it that way, at a yeah. challenging moment. What would you tell, if, if you could write the sort of the top three priorities yeah. for the next president of the United States, what would you say? Well, you know, uh, whimsically... To sustain it, let me put it in the context, because there is the feeling that uh, America is losing some of that 
yeah. strength, and certainly globally, the ability to influence. Yeah. So what would what would you say? Well, you know, I, I I'm going to give a non-serious answer. Um, I think America is too big. I think it's ungovernable. You know, you've got two. You just look at. I mean, I don't need. To say I I think it's ungovernable. It is ungovernable. Right. They didn't have a government for two weeks. You know, <laughs> that, which is like so ludicrous. Um, I think uh, I think they should divide themselves up into about sort of three different countries. It'd work way better. New York could be one country, that's where I live, and then you know they could, the rest could sort of you know sort it out amongst themselves. Um, and I say that only half flippantly. I actually think Canada should be two countries. I just don't think there, there are some people here who think that. For some yeah, time. yeah. I think we if, can argue about where we want Remy to put Levesque the dividing back line. From his, uh, um, some people would want to put the dividing line between. Toronto and Mississauga, but I think that's probably unfair. <laughs> You'd probably want to move it somewhere to the west. But um, uh, no, it's just like because if you think about it, there are all these reasons why we wanted to be big in the 19th century. They don't really, they're not around anymore. Right. At, at you know. some level, actually, aren't all of the boundaries being reconceived? I mean, the Middle East boundaries are being reconceived. The and global we should boundaries. be fine with that. I mean, if Alberta wants to be a separate country, why is that such a bad thing? I mean, we'd get along with them. We would trade with them. We well, could visit probably, there. There's probably something around economies of scale, but anyway. But um, no, 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 but that's but, an interesting question. So this is, um, and it goes to a lot of what I was talking about, that I believe that the, the kinds of things that we associate, uh, the advantages that we associate with size tend to be greatly overstated. And the, the, um, the disadvantages we associate with being small tend to be overstated. And this is, if you think of the direction of a lot of the technologies in the right. world we it's, live in, it's very they, have the, right. they have the, uh, uh, the effect of making smallness less of a disadvantage and bigness more of a disadvantage. Oh, well, for sure. I mean, just look at the impact of Osama bin Laden and that very small cadre yeah. to fundamentally reshape the way America operates and the Western world operates. Yeah, right? yeah. So um, there is something maybe about the whole world that's rethinking what what is a David mm -hmm. and is a David fundamentally equal. And yeah, you can send yeah. one email and get it to the whole world. So is, 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 there, is there something about that that relates to your stories? Something about the current dynamic, the impact of technology to force us to rethink mm -hmm. Or to experience the world yeah. differently, and your the specific examples when you talk about individuals. Is, 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 yeah. Are there some parallels or some, well, I, some yeah. inter? I sort of, I mean, I don't have any. I don't go into that in the book. I am always terrified to write about technology in a book because, you know, it moves so fast that by the time you're finished, it's all out there. Like if I had written about technology with my first book, The Tipping Point, I would have written about the fax machine. And how humiliating would that be today? Like a whole chapter on the transformative nature of the fax machine. And so like anyone who's picking that book up today would be like, Good lord. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's so there are several several topics I always avoid because they're so I, I was I was trying for it seems like you've addressed it from an individual basis, this notion of what constitutes a David and Goliath and Yeah, no, I'm these, most and interested. is there like a larger Yeah. Sorry, you're most interested. I'm most interested in things in this story, what I wanted to do with this book was I wanted to tell uh, personal stories right. as much as possible. Right. Um, just because um, uh, this book is much more about, I wanted to stress the storytelling side of my writing in this book right. much so more than in the previous books. Um, and I, there's something about a kind of, there's a unique power in telling, yeah. like the, there's a chapter in this book on my might be my favorite chapter about this guy, Emil Freire, oh, yeah. okay. who uh, is the man who cures childhood leukemia. And he's this extraordinary figure, difficult, complicated, troubled guy, but a genius, and who, he's disagreeable. He's the most obnoxious person you've ever met. And when you meet him, you realize that that, the first time I talked to him was for something totally different. I randomly called him up. And after about 10 minutes, I wanted to hang up on him. And I thought about it, and then I learned a bit more about him, and I began to realize, wait a second, this guy is someone who had an idea about how to cure leukemia, which was so crazy and so completely out of left field and so contrary to what everyone thought that when he 
started to kind of pursue it, everyone in his world told him he was crazy and tried to stop him and denounced him and heckled him and wouldn't work with him and ostracized him. And he was so ornery and so contrary, they didn't care. He basically gave them the finger and kept doing it and uh, ended up being right. And I realized there's no way he could have done that unless he was a profoundly difficult, complicated, ornery personality. And then I asked the question, well, where did that come from? And, I re- and he had this horrible childhood. And, he dis- and it was because he survived this childhood that he realized he could put up with any level of crap from the rest of the world. It empowered him, in other words. And that was such an interesting notion that out of the bleakness of his personal adversity came a man so powerful that he was able to take on the medical establishment and win. And that that notion, actually, I was going to say, entertain us with a few stories because the book is, you feel the storytelling in the book. Um, And I wanted you to tell the story of the Palo Alto Oh, soccer yes. coach, which is a great story. And then I want to get into this notion of empowerment and also where the maybe there's a passion, an insane passion that also goes with these people. Yeah. But tell us about the... the um, Vivek Ramadev. Vivek is this guy who I meet, met randomly at a conference in Silicon Valley, and I just started chatting with him because I... Um, and, of course, I never... I have this thing where I can never remember anyone's face. So... And this is on numerous occasions in my life, I've met people who turn out to have been very famous, and I have not realized who they were. Most, and I won't go into the story about um, Jennifer Aniston, but that's <laughs> that I, did actually happen. Um, that I, she tried to engage in conversation, and I was very rude to her because it didn't occur to me until ten minutes later that it was Jennifer Aniston. Anyway, I'm talking to this guy, and so we, I asked him about. We just chit chatting. He starts to tell me about how he uh, he coached his twelve year old daughter's basketball team, and he was Indian, and so he didn't know anything about basketball. So he started to do his research and went to some basketball games, and was just totally perplexed by the way Americans played basketball, because he didn't understand. But why why would you re- retreat into your own end after scoring a basket and wait for the other team to bring the ball up? Particularly if you were the if you were the weaker team, it made no sense that you would if you were the weaker team, you would allow the stronger team to more easily do the thing that made them stronger than you, that is to say, execute a play and shoot him. And this is particularly relevant because the team that he was coaching, he quickly understood, was terrible. They they didn't know how to play basketball. There were all these nerdy girls from Menlo Park who would come home at night and study biology. They didn't have they weren't shooting baskets. So he decides they're gonna. The only way they're ever gonna win is if they play. Uh, he says to them, "We're not gonna practice shooting, dribbling, passing, anything that resembles basketball. It's pointless. You guys are too terrible. <laughs> what we're gonna do is, I'm, we're just gonna play the full court press every single moment of every single game. In other words, we're gonna defend every inch of the basketball court. We're gonna deny the inbounds pass. We're just gonna do this." The entire game, and they can do this because that's the one thing they can do. And um, so he starts to do this with his team. And it turns out, if you do this in twelve-year-old girls basketball, um, the other team will never even advance the ball past midcourt. So he starts to win games like six nothing because <laughs> if you hold the other team to zero points, you don't need to score a lot of points to win. <laughs> Turns out, six is fine. And, because he does every now and again, they do practice layups. And also, it's like a monkey with a typewriter. If, if a 12-year-old girl throws the ball up in the vicinity of the basket enough times, <laughs> it will eventually go in. 10,000 uh, times. Yeah, so, uh, so he does, and he goes all the way to the national championship. Which is so hilarious because his team is terrible, and he, um, the other coaches are just—he's drive, he drives them crazy because the thing that he is playing is not actually basketball, right? No basketball-like maneuvers take place on the in the games that he's playing. But of course, he as a, why would he care? He's like a soccer mogul from Mumbai. I mean, he has no stake in the outcome of this basketball game. 
Um, what I what I loved about it, and people got very upset with them because they said what you are doing is not like I said, you're not teaching your girls basketball, and the point of this basketball league is to teach girls how to play basketball. And his reply was, "You're quite right. We're not playing basketball, but I'm teaching my girls something far more important, which is just because you are." utterly without skill and talent, doesn't mean you should roll over and play dead. You can fight back. Just do something different and obnoxious. Don't be passive, right? And, I, and to teach 12-year-olds not to be passive in the face of overwhelming odds is the most important lesson you can possibly teach them. Vivek is absolutely right, right? And I just find that story, first of all, it's, it's hilarious. Um, but it's also such a beautiful introduction to any discussion of underdogs. I mean, it's the story of David and his battle of, with Goliath. It's the story of Israel and their battles. Are, I mean, you could, you could give 10 different versions of, of how beautiful Ch this is. Change uh, the rules of the game. Change the rules. Why do you believe you can? can. Yeah, and, and don't worry. And need to. And don't worry about if the if opposing coaches you know, want to challenge you to fist fights in the parking lot after the game, you know, shrug it off. Don't let it bother you. I mean, don't fight them. The Beck is five foot two and 110 pounds. He probably shouldn't get into fist fights if he could all help it. Um, but like that's, accept the fact that you're going to make some people angry and move on. Have you made people angry along the way with the tenacity of your thinking? No, I'm such a sweet. I'm a I'm a sweet, harmless boy from small town Ontario. How could I possibly make anyone upset? So what's the story? What what is the story behind the story? What do you mean the story like behind where, the story? Where did you grow up? Oh, what challenges oh, did you have? Did you try and play basketball and have? No, no, no. I I actually I, I, don't fit this at all. I am not even remotely right. either a David or a Goliath. I grew up in Elmira. Do I get a shout out for Elmira? Thank you. Thank you. I um, I have lovely parents, delightful brothers, fantastic friends. I had no traumas, adversities at all along the way. Um, I am I could not, if I wanted to, have written a chapter on myself in this book. Um, but did you imagine? When did you think? Okay, I'm going to write for a living. Do you think of yourself as a writer, as a thinker? No, I'm not a thinker. I'm um, I'm a journalist. I. I oh, talk okay. to thinkers, okay, um, and I make sure that the tape recorder is running when I do that. Um, and I, uh, I, you know, I, I did. I only, uh, I kind of fell into this by accident. Really, it's kind of been a little. Um, I tried to get a job in advertising after graduating from U of T, and failed. Um, 14 consecutive times, and in fact, every time I applied to every advertising agency in Toronto and, you know, never heard back from any of them. And every time I meet someone who's in advertising in Toronto, I always say to them, you know, you should, can you do me a favor and just look through the stack of resumes on your desk? Because I'm convinced mine's still there somewhere, buried under a... And there are am amazing people who are doing that. I've heard other stories like that of people who are rejected time and time and time and time and time yeah. again, and then eventually... Succeeded. I didn't take it to heart, so... Right, yeah. so you didn't. But Neil Diamond tried to sell his songs for about 10 years. Oh, really? At the Brill Building, and never could sell a song, trying to write for somebody else, and then decided out of desperation he's just going to write a song that he likes. Yeah. And then yeah. we had Neil Diamond. But anyway, yeah. um, you spoke recently at the Grano series, and you were quoted as saying that you were surprised to see how many successful people consider themselves to be underdogs. <laughs> so yeah. S say more. Say more about sort of what that reaction, you know, what you heard from them, and how that struck you. Well, it was going back to what I was saying earlier, that when you talk to people are, who are successful, that what turns out to have been formative, formative in their experience are their difficulties. Um, so the, one of the chapters in the book is about, for example, dyslexics, and about this weird fact that among successful entrepreneurs, there are, is a hugely disproportionate number of dyslexics. And when you talk to them, what you discover is that uh, they they think they succeeded not in spite of their disability, but because of it. That actually they wouldn't be where they are today had they not been uh, afflicted with that particular problem. That 
In other words, that the the task, the effort that that it took to work their way around the fact they couldn't read, forced them to learn so many things mm -hmm. that were of such enormous value that they ended up being far ahead of where they would have been if they could read. I heard that story. I interviewed. I got so fascinated with this today when I was doing my book. By the way, the number of dyslexic entrepreneurs is so long. I mean, it, there's an, literally an endless number of them. Um, I began to believe, first of all, that there, there weren't any non-dyslexic <laughs> entrepreneurs. Um, but I interviewed so many of them that uh, I could almost tell them, by the end, I could tell their story to them before they told it to me. They're all like, they would also, they would, so these are the ones who make it. And they're a fraction of the overall group. But so they all have the same story. They get they, in about grade two, when it's clear they can't do the thing everyone else can do, they have to start to strategize, and they all have a series of strategies. When I say all, it's astonishing how many of them have a similar. So they start by they all befriend the smartest kid in the class. Right? Genius. They figure out, oh, Susie's really smart. So they sidle up to Susie, and they become best friends with Susie. And lo and behold, Susie does most of their homework. homework. Um, and they put together these th teams of people who start to do their homework for them. And then they become really good at negotiating with teachers. From a really young age, they basically, they'll flunk the test, and then they'll sit down with the teacher afterwards and say, look, you and I both know I, I'm not someone who fails tests. <laughs> and they talk their way up. They get really good at talking their way out of problems. They all cheat. In fact, this is the, I didn't put it in the book because I felt badly about it, but <laughs> the cheating stories, I started collecting cheating stories of successful dyslexics. They're fantastic. In fact, one guy who, name I won't know, who won't, won't know, won't I tell you, um, very, very successful, multi, 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 zillionaire. Um, the story of how he got into college, hilarious. Um, <laughs> Let's just say he had very little to do with the application procedure. <laughs> um, but no, these elaborate strategies. And I, you know, I, I sort of should have gone into it because there's cheating. Some people cheat because they're unethical and they're looking for a shortcut. These people are not unethical and looking for a shortcut. They're cheating out of a genuine desperation. They're in a world. These are often people who were dyslexics at a time and place in our society when people didn't understand the disability. They thought that these kids were had, had were you know mentally disabled in some way. I mean they really thought they were dumb and called them dumb. So here are kids who would like to make something of their life, who understand that unless they can make it through school that's not going to happen. And yet are constitutionally incapable of doing the thing that can make it that can get through school. So what are their options? Right? Well, option number one is to befriend Susie. Option number two is to strategize and talk, get the teacher to talk your grade out. But that's only going to get you so far. So what's option number three? Cheat. And, and they're cheating out of the best of intentions. They, they survival. love survival. Survival strategy. Survival, survival right. strategy. And so they come up with these incredibly elaborate strategies for um, effective cheating. Because they have to cheat. Remember as well, people who cheat, normal cheaters, cheat sp sporadically, every now and again. I didn't study for the math exam. Oh, dear. So what do they do? They write the answers here, or they peek over the shoulder. These dyslexics have to cheat every single time, right? So their strategies are just so much better. I mean, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're fantastic. There was one, it got, I mean, anyway, I, I developed, I, I, I made these like long lists of all of these, and I wanted to sort of publish an appendix <laughs> to my book on how to cheat, um, but I thought the, that might The legitimacy be. of cheating if you're dyslexic. Or, yeah, that or, might, or, yeah, or yeah, I dyslexic thought cheating, I didn't want dyslexic parents cheating. banning my book. Get, yeah, get you to. I did, I do recall that um, many years ago, a man named Abe Zelesnik wrote about the similarities between entrepreneurs and felons. That yeah. There's actually a yeah. yeah. That there's actually yeah. I mean one go the right route, one go the wrong route, mm -hmm. but this absolute a unwillingness to follow yeah. orders and then to take detours. I, I once I once hung out. I remember this years ago with the uh, I forget how I found him with the number one crack dealer in Harlem. I spent an afternoon with him, and he was 
So I didn't know what to expect. I and got he his says name. there's no stories. No, no, no. I got his name, and I thought I, who know? I don't know. You know, what do you? First of all, what do you wear when you're meeting with him? <laughs> but um, so I didn't know what I what he was going to be like. So I'm sitting here. We're supposed to meet at this, you know, park bench in Harlem. So I wait, you know, do do do. And I look up, and there's a guy who watched Breaking Bad. Remember, right. remember Gus Fring? This was Gus Fring. It was like a guy dressed in like pressed khakis, a button-down shirt, a good, nice jacket. He like tortoise shell glasses, and he had like a like a kind of briefcase thing, and he's like shook my hand. And then he started talking about the crack market in Harlem, like he was selling, you know. Plumbing supplies. I mean, it was just the most kind of like fascinating. He's talking about the decline in this, and his margins were thin over here, and his competitors were doing this wrong, and and I just realized like there's just no. Here was a the, one of the biggest criminals in <coughs> New York City, and he was just a businessman. Who, Why were you meeting with him? <laughs> first of all, if you could meet with the biggest crack dealer in Harlem, you wouldn't jump at the chance. I mean, it was fantastic. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to meet with him? Okay. I, I, did, I did a story on him, I think. I forget. I thought it was the journalist in you. Yeah. Um, underdogs. Yes. You look at America today, I guess this could be true in Canada too, but the statistics are more overt in America and the amazing divide that is growing between the 1% with the money and mm -hmm. the 99% without. And as I was reading the book, I thought somewhere, somehow, this book could fit into that discussion. Like, does yeah. it does it provoke a discussion about how something has to happen mm -hmm. with what feels like the growing underdogs? So, yeah. Well, the, so the, the the thing I think applies. There's a, a section in the book where I talk about this a concept called desirable difficulties, which is this idea that uh, these two wonderful psychologists in Bjork at at UCLA have come up with. And I've done all this research which says, normally when we think about, when I make the task of learning something harder, you will learn less, right? Or your way will be more difficult. And they point out that that's not true, that there are a certain specific set of instances where if I make your task harder, you will end up doing better. And they call these instances desirable difficulties. And their, their notion is that you can divide bad things into two groups. One set makes you stronger, one set does not. It's just a genuine burden. And so the really interesting question is, when we look at the growing division in our society between rich and poor, is that a desirable or an undesirable difficulty? And for those on the bottom, and I think it's very clear it is an undesirable difficulty at the moment. But there are moments when, when that gap is much narrower, the difference between those here and those here can be desirable. It's to be a little bit behind and to have that fire in your belly right. and to be forced to fight and to overcome obstacles. If the end result is attainable, that's desirable. You want to be hungry and nimble. When the gap's like this, which it is now, that's no longer desirable. That's it becomes overwhelming. It becomes overwhelming. It becomes overwhelming. Yeah. You do get the sense that there's something in that discussion about resilience. So that, that underdog, that person who was just, you know, angry and willing and kept fighting and going or wherever, that there is something that you, you, you need some resilience and you need yeah. to grow that resilience. And that's, I guess that's the question, um, is are huge swaths of America losing that, even that ability to develop that resilience? You mean at the top? Oh, well, in this case, I was referring to it at the bottom. Like, is the disparity yeah. so huge oh, or the disadvantage? Yeah. Um, but in a way, that's it's probably true at both ends. And, and yeah. Yeah. to what extent has this, I guess, made you think about resilience? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think about it. I mean, I have a, I did a chapter in the book on a, uh, a very, 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 very rich man who was observing the fact that he had become wealthy because he, because of the lessons he learned growing up in a, family that didn't have a lot and he learned the meaning of work and he learned the satisfaction you get from achievement and all those kinds of things 
And he made a vast fortune, and now he was looking back at his own children and realizing he had deprived them of every one of those important lessons. And as a result, they would never make something of themselves as he had. And he was sort because of they were so indulged. They were so indulged. Yeah. He was sort of ruefully pointing out that he made a lot of money to provide for his family, and yet in making a lot of money to provide for his family, he impoverished them, right? He denied them a chance to do something meaningful of their own life. And I, and you know, he. Uh, that's a really, really crucial lesson. That, you know, at the extremes, mm -hmm. wealth is as um, disempowering mm -hmm. as poverty. Not in the same way. Right. Consequences are very different, but it robs people of the chance uh, to achieve their potential in the same way. Um, I I heard a great little story in that uh, one night on this stage. I was interviewing. Izzy Sharp, who is the founder of the Four Seasons, and he told a wonderful story. And he had a very challenging and difficult childhood. And he said the one thing he couldn't <coughs> give his kids was poverty. Yeah. To to to, to wrestle. Well, he could. To the one thing he <laughs> chose not, not to, to give his kids exactly. was poverty. So, I mean, so, so. look, there's lots of options available <laughs> right. for. To, to, yeah. to do them. Tell us one more of the great stories that you uncovered, because it is so much about those stories that brings it home. One of your other favorites. One of my other favorites. Uh, well, I, there's a story I, I tell the story of uh, when the Civil Rights Movement came to Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama, and Martin Luther King takes on uh, the biggest white supremacist in the South, Bull Connor, and King has nothing. He's got no money, he's just coming off a huge defeat in Albany, Georgia, he's when he calls, when he tries to have marches in the beginning of the Birmingham campaign, 12 people will show up. And he's got this deputy named Wyatt Walker, who's one of the great characters in all of the civil rights history. And Walker is a classic underdog who refuses to give up and who uh, he <laughs> plays a series of tricks. Birmingham, Alabama is a Victory in the end for Martin Luther King because King and White Walker play a series of hilarious, elaborate tricks on the white supremacist leadership and the white press. And I won't give away the greatest trick of all they play, but the first trick they play is one day, so Walker is organizing these daily protests from 16th Street Baptist Church, and he's getting a dozen people, which is nothing, right? Nothing's happening. And one day they get delayed until after 5 o'clock, and what would happen at 5 o'clock is that all the African Americans working in downtown Birmingham would come to the church to see what was going on. And so <laughs> hundreds of them would come and just gather around to see it was like a spectacle. So that day, the march goes out at 5.30, and there's all these people hanging around. And the next day, White Walker opens the newspaper and discovers that all of the white reporters have said, and yesterday in Birmingham, 1,200 people marched on... And he realized, oh my God, they can't tell the difference between bystanders and marchers. <laughs> to the reporters, all black people look the same. So he's like, fantastic. So he, he calls King, King's in Atlanta, calls him up and says, Doc, he said, they used to call him Mr. Leader. <coughs> Mr. Leader, I've solved our problem. It's like, from now on, every march begins at 5.30, right? And so they do, and sure enough, you know, from there on, there's this sort of, in the kind of uh, media story on the Birmingham protests, there was this magic moment when they swelled into thousands of people, right? And each day the numbers got bigger and bigger and bigger. It was just that people were coming down to watch and like, black person with a black person to these, anyway, he builds on that and he goes to this, I don't, like I said, I'm not gonna give away the punchline of that story because uh, Wyatt Walker ends up with this most remarkable uh, trick of all, um, uh, which which everyone everyone swallows hook, line, and sinker, but it's this, it's a it's a testament to this lovely thing about underdogs, which is when you have nothing and when you've never had anything, right? So for 200 years, black people in America didn't have anything. What do you learn? Well, you learn to be smarter than your opponent, um, and and that's exactly what happened in, in Birmingham. Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking about that story. 
Um, don't give it away. Yeah, no, no, that's, I, 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 no okay, I, I won't. Um, to me, this I read this book, um, I learned something, like everybody in this room, I learned something meaningful in each one of your books. Meaningful. And, and I know that I'm speaking for everybody here. This book, I thought in a way, was the ultimate um, entrepreneur's book. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some level, everybody is an entrepreneur. I mean, they're having to create their lives. And, and, and I just wonder if you want to say to everybody in this room uh, something that would inspire them from this idea. What, yeah. what do you feel that, that people could, could hear from you that at the essence of this notion that you can change the game, you can... Yeah. Just, I mean, it's, this, it's the lesson of Vivek and the girls' basketball team, which is uh, don't be passive in the face of what seems like over overwhelming disadvantage. I mean, it's, that's what's so beautiful about that story and the many stories I tell in these books. They're about uh, people who re- refuse to accept the kind of conventional judgment of their prospects. So that notion of feeling empowered, and this will be the last time I'm going to turn it to that, because I think that's what I, I kind of get from, things from the message, this notion of like, the opposite of being passive. Mm-hmm. Or even cynical that you're empowered. I sometimes feel like you could div- you could choose to divide the world into two groups of people: the people who somehow feel empowered and a sense of control over their lives, and a group of <coughs> people who don't yeah. feel a sense. And then that turns into a kind of cynicism, and that's angry, and it, it's hard to unleash it. Um, if you were if you were meeting with people who talk to you or say that they just they they can't they can't take control of their lives. Mm-hmm. You feel that at some level everybody can take control of their lives? Everybody Everyone can, can try. I mean, I think that's the... What impresses me about the stories in this book that I tell about underdogs is not their success, because their success wasn't guaranteed. Mm-hmm. What impresses me is their effort, is the fact that they, they took a shot <coughs> at winning. And we know that underdogs are not going to win every battle, otherwise they, would never, they wouldn't be underdogs. Right. David could easily have missed Goliath with his stone from his sling. But the point is that he <coughs> tried. He played. Right? No one else in the Israelite army wanted to take on Goliath. Only this kid wanted to. And I love that notion that he was like willing to take a chance. Play the game. Stay at the table. Yeah. Play. That's, play. I mean, that's, that's a pretty, pretty amazing, amazing message. Let me turn this over to the audience. We'll take a couple of questions. That is so Hi. wonderful. I loved, it was my favorite book of all the books you've written because, well, for a lot of reasons, but um, I really felt your passion for these stories. Like, I think I felt you were really excited for that basketball team. Like, you were mm-hmm. like, gosh darn, I can't believe it. But in the book, you never talk about, is it people, I mean, are they already predisposed to being able to fight Goliath? Or... You know, like, do they have it in them already? Is there a way to dis- to tell? Like, maybe some people just don't have that kind of crispa. Yeah. yeah. No, it's you're absolutely right. Not everyone does. Um, and in many cases, what I'm describing, like with the dyslexics, and I say, you know, many many dyslexics do not become successful entrepreneurs. They are they are burdened by their obstacle, not 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 empowered by it. Um, do I have a good understanding of what the difference is between those who manage to make something of their ops, of their adversity and those who don't? I don't. Um, I don't think anyone does. It's it's a thousand different things. Um, only in the chapter when I talk about the way that Londoners reacted to the Blitz, to the bombing by the Nazis, do I come close to try and answer that question. Um, but in general, it's uh, that's one of, I think that's one of life's unknowable mysteries. You know, you can't, I have never in my books, and the reason my books are not really self-help books is that I never pretend that I can answer all of these questions. You know, I sort of think um, that's one of the things I hope that readers do is to reflect on it and try and come up with their own interpretations. Beautiful. Yes. Uh, first off, thanks very much. Thank you very much for another excellent book. 
Um, I feel that I can professionally relate to one of the characters in your book, Emil Freireich. And when I was reading the story, um, I sort of looked at it from the opposite perspective of the kids that he was treating and how they must feel as, you know, up against these insurmountable odds. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how to address people in that kind of situation where, it, where they feel like they have these undesirable difficulties. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the trick, you know, the role that society ought to play <coughs> is to transform undesirable difficulties to desirable difficulties. In other words, it's asking too much that we can give everyone um, a comfort a comfortable, adversity-free life. Uh, that's never going to happen. Um, we would like to be able to do that, but that's realistically no. What we need to do, I think, though, is to try and get people in a position where they can meaningfully deal with their, fight those fights and deal with their adversity. And that's some combination of giving them hope, but also limiting their obstacles to the, to the ones that are um, winnable, the fights, the ones that are winnable. Um, and that's a kind of, you know, that, that sounds like a very vague, abstract thing, but it's not in a certain sense, because it says, what is the function of having public conversations about the role of government in society? And I think the answer to that is, those conversations should be about priorities. It should be, what is the worst kind of obstacle that Canadians face? Let's tackle that one first. Are there other obstacles that maybe aren't as bad as we think they are? Let's think with those last. So I have a whole <coughs> chapter in my book about class size and how we have gotten obsessed with making classes as small as possible, when in many cases a, a medium-sized class is a desirable difficulty. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, let's stop worrying so much about that, and let's focus our attention on other problems that are a lot more pressing. Right. So it's, I think that the the, the way to respond to your question is to have a uh, have a conversation about priorities. Right. Last one. Do we have? Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, I guess in many ways the archetype of the underdog is very common. Uh, everything from Cinderella to Rocky and so on. But what's really interesting in what you said is that even very successful people think of themselves often as underdogs. I'm wondering if you came across examples of stories where former underdogs realized they were no longer underdogs, and the, uh, the realization actually led to interesting changes and positive changes. Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, do everyone, well, the <laughs> so I think it's probably rare. I was most struck by the I've been most struck by how how long people cling to their underdog underdogginess uh, uh, long after it's plausible. But um, you know what's a good example though? And I uh, one of my great heroes is Bill Gates uh, because I feel like he's a man who um, is attempting right now. He and his wife are going to do something right now that is extraordinary and that is to spend one of the largest fortunes in the history of mankind in as thoughtful and intelligent a way as possible in order to address some of the world's most serious problems. Now, he is a man who, in the beginning, was running a scrappy <coughs> little underdog firm. And I think he woke up one day and said, I'm no longer, that, that's no longer an appropriate role for me to play. I'm no longer that upstart. Right? I am now as big and as powerful and as mainstream as it gets. And I have to do something. I have to uh, find another way to make a meaningful contribution to the world mm -hmm. in which I live. Mm -hmm. And he chose not to sail expensive yachts and not to buy enormous valuable baubles for his girlfriends and not to do all the things, not to, not to hang around with Russian oligarchs. He chose to do something which is sadly all too rare among the ultra-rich, which is to ask the question, can I cure malaria? Can I, can I make the water clean in Africa? Or, you know, and then and 10 other questions like that. 
And so there's a guy who didn't get trapped in that delusion and didn't realize he had to keep burrowing away, trying to make more and more millions, and st instead accepted his position, said, I am now Goliath, but I'm going to be the best damn Goliath of my generation. And my, my hat is off to that man. I think um, in this day and age, one of the most generous things that a writer can do is choose to go on a book tour. And it is even more generous with somebody who is as accomplished as you are. So I just want to say thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And if you will agree to find books for all of these people, fantastic. So we're going to set up for everybody to who wants to come up and have their books signed. Thank you very much. Folks, if you'll just stay seated, we're bringing a signing table up onto the stage. For those folks that just arrived, Leo in the back, raise your hand. We're doing slips, groupings. If you don't yet have a grouping and you want your book signed, go see Leo. He's standing at the bottom of the stairs. For those folks that are sitting, just stay seated. For those folks that have... Folks, we're seated. You can stand up. You can make uh, your way down the middle of the aisle, row by row. Monitor yourself. Here we go.